Okay, looks like we're live. Um, what, I would... one, one moment. Oh, okay. I got it, Vanessa, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Larry. Um, I'd like to call the Public Works Committee of the Common Council meeting uh, to order. Uh, today's Tuesday, March 1st at seven o'clock. Um, first item um, on the agenda is roll call. So uh, tonight we have with us all members of the committee. We have Tom Keegan, uh, Lisa Shanahan, Nora Najelski eichner Tom Livingston, Darlene Young, Dominique Johnson, and myself, Barbara Smith. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, public input. Do we have any members of the public? I don't see any attendees. No, we do not. All right, very good. So we'll move on to uh, new business. Uh, first um, item is to approve the minutes of the Public Works Committee meeting of Tuesday, February 1st. Uh, do I have a motion, please? Mr. Livingston moves the item. Are there any changes, corrections? No. Okay, uh, seeing none, all in favor? Raise your hand, please. Opposed? Extensions. Okay, minutes pass unanimously. Um, all right, uh, the first item on the agenda, um, item two, authorize the mayor, Harry W. Rilling, to enter into maintenance agreement number 11.23-0121 11 with the Connecticut Department of Transportation to maintain granite curbing, crosswalks, plantings, and other non-state standard appurtenances requested by the city and installed within the state right-of-way as part of encroachment permit number 3019477 issued to Norwalk Land Development, LLC. Um, would someone like to move that? Ms. Shanahan moves the item. Um, and this has to do with the agreement uh, on the ramp to I-95. Um, and I'm gonna ask uh, Mr. Carr, our Chief of Public Works to um, give us the background information on that. Yes, I, Madam Chairwoman, I could certainly do that. The, um, you know, and Vanessa could obviously give a little more context. The, uh, so this agreement is to permit, uh, to authorize the mayor, obviously, to allow uh, the Connecticut DOT to work within um, on, on their ramps and, and areas outside of their right of way. So it would be technically city right of way, um, but it, it gives them permission and allows them uh, to install uh, right of way items such as concrete curb, uh, granite curb, sidewalks, things of that nature. Uh, again, on the, I believe the northbound or southbound ramp, I know Vanessa could, could clarify exactly where, where the improvements will be situated. But yes, it, it, um, um, let me just, sorry to jump in. So this work actually already happened, um, Anthony. What, what happened is that during the development of the mall, um, as part of the approval plan for that development, um, the city requested through, I believe, the land use, some improvements on the I-95 exit uh, 15 northbound. So that's why we have a traffic light there. We have a brick paver crosswalk and some shrubs. So that ended up being installed by the mall as part of the approved plan. What happened now is that that is not the city right of way. It's actually the state right of way. So as part of the deal, we ask permission to allow the mall to install that with the caveat that we will be maintaining because DOT will never gonna maintain a brick paver crosswalk that is typical for, for our South Norwalk, for instance, uh, district. So after everything is completed, now we just need to sign this agreement. But the reason that is in front of you is that we just wanna bring to your attention that we are really responsible for the maintenance of those um, improvements that were asked during the plan review process and that the mall installed. So the mall installed, there was no cost to the city, but we are now responsible for the maintenance of it within the state right of way. Um, and also I have Darren Callahan here to answer further questions and also Michael, because Michael was also involved during this agreement when the mall was developed. 
I guess, I, I guess I'm confused where this is. I mean, this is next to the mall going up on a 95? Correct, right there. Yeah, and there is the sidewalk there. Yeah, the sidewalk, I believe that is not the issue, but across from the mall is where is the state right of way. So mm -hmm. we, we asked them to install granite curb to match what we have on West Avenue. Uh, and that's already a state right of way. And there is a crosswalk there as well. And we ask for the brick pavers. And I believe there is, well, uh, what a, and then also some shrubs that we ended up installed there. Okay. Thank you. So that's what we just need to maintain that. So it's the planting, the crosswalk, and the granite curbing. Because if it gets hit or if there is an accident, they're not going to come and repair. Um, Ms. Nijewski Eichner. Just to quickly clarify, um, I appreciate that the mall paid for the original installation. Does the mall have maintenance responsibilities uh, or, or responsibilities to, to, re to pay us back for maintenance? No, uh, that was the whole part of the agreement. Uh, to be honest, um, the city saw that as an opportunity to improve and carry over, you know, the same, let's say, um, standards that we have through West Avenue. Um, so during the plan review, we asked that to be approved as part of their process. So could we could match and carry over that extra block. Um, and that's what, what happened. But the caveat was, okay, we're going to accept that as DOT, but you guys will have to maintain. We don't want to maintain. And that makes sense. It's, I mean, it's absolutely, it's an ideal. I'm glad you guys pushed for that because it's nice to have the consistency. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, seeing no more questions, all in favor, raise your hand. Opposed? Abstentions? All right, that carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, the next three items on the agenda are actually uh, connected, um, although I don't believe I can read them all at the same time. Um, so item number three, authorize the mayor, Harry W. Rilling, to execute an amendment to the March 29, 2021 agreement between the city of Norwalk and AI engineers for project number DPW 2021-1 on-call engineering services. The amendment is to extend the agreement for a period of one year at a sum not to exceed $100,000, billable on an hourly basis with an option to extend for one additional term for one year. Account numbers noted. Uh, would someone like to move that, please? Uh, Ms. Najelski Eichner moves it. Um, and then I will turn it over to, uh, to Mr. Carr to introduce this. And you know, I think you can touch upon all three. Um, yes, absolutely, Madam Jimmy. Yeah. So, so each... Um, Items three, four, and five are associated with one another. And these, these items consist of DPW's on-call engineering services. Uh, we, we utilize three different consultants, AI engineers, uh, Weston and Samson engineers, and Time Bond. Uh, they each have their specialty and, and a variety of disciplines that helps assist DPW for, for specialty items or even uh, some of the day-to-day -day work that staff um, cannot cover or allocate resources to. Uh, the original agreements uh, were approved um, on, on 2-9-2021. And they did have a, um, an option in there to extend for two terms of one year each. So we're, we're respectfully requesting uh, from the committee your recommendation uh, to the full council that each of these items, three, four, and five, each of these on-call engineering service contracts are extended for the additional one year. Uh, we have a lot of work. Um, each of the amounts are the same. They're all for $100,000 um, extensions and they're built on an hourly basis. And again, this is to support a lot of the capital projects and, and the small projects that come up um, sometimes unknowingly, uh, a lot of different issues that we try to address uh, as quickly as possible, but, but they do assist with, with, with capital projects and they're a very big help. And if we didn't have these consultants assisting us, um, they, are, they are providing the services in lieu of having the additional staff required to perform that work. Are there any questions about item three? Okay, seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Abstentions? All right, item three carries unanimously. Um, item four, 
authorize the mayor, Harry W. Rilling, to execute an amendment to the March 29, 2021 agreement between the city of Norwalk and Weston and Sampson Engineers, Inc. for project number DPW 2021-1, on-call engineering services. The amendment is to extend the agreement for a period of one year at a sum not to exceed $100,000, billable on an hourly basis with an option to extend for one additional term for one year, account numbers noted, um, um, motion, uh, who would like to move that please? Um, Ms. Young moves the item. And uh, same thing here. This is, uh, I, I believe uh, we, you had noted uh, that this firm, uh, Weston and Sampson is particularly good with permits. Yes, Anthony, Madam Chairman. Chairman. Yes, yes. So they really help us out with permits. Um, any questions about that? Ms. Young has a question. You're on mute. Sorry. Um, I have a question just about all three of them. So how long have we been operating like this? Just to refresh my memory. It's been a while. Just one year. Just one year yes. with Yes, yeah. so this is the first year and we use all the funds allocated uh, last year. Um, in the summary, there is a list of the projects that they help us with. Um, so this is the first extension. Um, and then we also are allowed to a second one year extension. Okay. So this is different from the other types of contractual um, agreements we go into for other areas. Correct. So, so just to refresh everyone's mind, what we did is in the past, we put a, an RFQ a request for a qualification and then we engage uh, three companies um, that is part of this pool of uh, engineer companies that we can use. Um, and then depending on the service that we need to outsource, we send out like some kind of a little task orders to each one. And then some of them we see maybe the price will be more, um, will speak out and then we may give that scope to a certain company. But sometimes we know that certain comp companies have a very strong background on something that we need. And then we're gonna, so for instance, uh, as Mrs. Smith just said, Weston and Sampson, it's very good on permitting with the Connecticut DEP and all that. So if we have anything related to those issues, most of the time we're gonna give something uh, to them um, to work on. And it's all, we we'll always, it's not a big contract to be, to be honest, $100,000 goes extremely fast. It's not that we're giving them a major project. If we have a major project, we put out an RFP for a, a design company. And that happened, um, for instance, I believe that last month, you guys approved um, tie and bond for a drainage uh, construction documents for Heather Lane. Um, so that contract, just to give you uh, some numbers, that the cost for that design was about two hundred and fifty-six thousand yep. dollars. So you see, this one, a hundred thousand for a whole year, is very little, small tasks. It's really trying to get some of the work that, unfortunately, sometimes we don't have staff to do during our busy times. Are there any other questions? Um, Ms. Najewski Eichner. Just to understand um, sort of for future kind of budgeting and scope processes, is this something where it's preferable to have these consulting services on call because they have particular expertise you don't need full time? Or is this a stopgap to make up for the fact that the department is understaffed? Um, I think it's kind of a combination. Yeah. Um, I so I think that some of these companies have the expertise that you know it will be very hard to hire some, a whole department with all that type of expertise. And also sometimes it is good to have extra hands, you know, um, even when, for instance, if we have a lot of plan reviews that we need, particularly for instance, during the winter, we receive a lot of uh, plan for, to review and we have a turnaround time. So if we get like a big developer, instead of spending like weeks, we can just send it out to one of them. They are very familiar with our drainage manual. They will be able to review in like three, four days and we still meet the deadlines for our residents. 
Okay, that's helpful. So again, just trying to think long-term in terms of your needs. Is there a sense that it's sort of 50-50 extra expertise versus, you know, hands that could be replaced by a staff member if you had them? Is it 80-20? Like what's the sort of- I would say it's 50-50 for now. You know, I don't know if it may change, but as of now, I'd say it's 50-50. Okay, thank you. That's helpful to understand. I mean, you know, we talked about this last month with uh, another uh, contract for um, uh, consulting um, where, you know, we asked the same question because that's, that's been something that's come up uh, year after year with public works, you know, what is it, is it more helpful to have a, a junior engineer? But I, if I recall, uh, Vanessa, you had said last, last month, and I don't remember the actual consulting firm off the top of it was for on call inspection that we inspection. had last month. Mm -hmm. Inspection. Yes. Yeah. So in that case, you, things have changed in that arena that it's actually uh, more efficient dollar wise to hire out. Than to have yeah. some stuff. Right. And the thing is too, Madam Chairman, if you, if you, uh, you know, you could hire a junior engineer, uh, I mean, and with, with, with salary and benefits, it's, it's going to cost the city, I mean, anywhere from 75 to $90,000 if you include the, the benefits, I mean, even higher than that. So think of it each contract for $100,000, you're, you're really getting a junior engineer with benefits and you could play with the percentages of benefits, of course, but the, um, the, the thing is they're still coming in junior, right? So, the 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 hundred thousand dollars with each of these consultants, you 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 have different staff types as outlined in their in their proposals, right? So you have principals, you have senior engineers, you have you have the equivalent of of what we have here in Norwalk, but you have staff that are specialized and and ready to be deployed and dedicated to the to the many needs of their municipal clients. So you know, and, and we would have to train that junior engineer, which isn't a, a bad thing at all, but it's still one one body, one staff. Where with the hundred thousand dollars. You're having a multitude, an array of, of, of various disciplines and various skill sets of different staff working on different projects. So it's just uh, it's something every municipality does because otherwise it, the, the the output would uh, would not be as, as desirable or, or there'd be a lot of input, but not as much output, if that makes any sense. So you are getting expertise. And, and like Vanessa said, I think the last meeting, um, with a construction inspector you know, like time bond, they're, they're very good with drainage and they're very good with our pavement program and they're very good inspectors. So we tend to use them. Although we, we, we will use AI engineers the way we are now for the Calf Pasta Beach uh, site improvement project or the, the new, the revised layout where they are doing drainage and stormwater management as well. So some of these consultants do overlapping things, but some are a little bit stronger or have more availability in let's say uh, geotechnical engineering, right? The study of soil and rock and water below the surface. So there, we know what those skill sets are based on our experiences. So, um, it's also good to spread the wealth. We don't want one consultant to get too dependent on uh, thinking that they're going to get every contract and every task order. So it's good to keep them honest because they know if there's, if there's work out there that's duplicative, meaning they can all three of them can do it, they, they're going to they tend to give us better pricing, knowing that there's competition and there's, a, there's other sharks in the pool, so to speak. So having the three vendors at our disposal, um, all of whom we have good relationships with, really broaden what we can do. So people like Vanessa and Paul and her staff, all the staff can continue doing what they're doing and they simply manage the consultant's effort. And also too, they're a buffer. You know, if things go to litigation or there's issues or there's problems, there, there's a third party looking at this and, and there's, uh, again, and they have their technical experts and their forensic engineers as well. So if there's ever an issue structurally, a failure, you know, they, they, they would partner with us and at least it wouldn't just be, hey, DPW, what are you doing? we would have an independent outside third party verifying the work and signing and sealing network. So it covers us on all bases, not just staffing, but I think also liability and, and, and amongst other things and obviously work, work output. So these contracts are, are, are great. I know it's something that Vanessa and her staff pushed to implement. I had these uh, in prior municipalities I've worked at as well. Um, we have an on-call drainage contract, if you remember, recall, uh, for, where a contractor goes and repairs the drainage in advance of paving. We have on-call surveying and now we have on-call engineering and, and with the level of service certainly not diminishing and, and the requests that are coming in, these on-call contracts are really, really the, the backbone at, at keeping the engineering uh, flowing. No pun intended, of course, but. Um, I also want to add one thing because, you know, when we have a company behind, we don't have only one person working on a project. Right. So I think that if, we have always the drafter as well, right? <coughs> Although we have the drafter in-house, we have two drafters that we keep them busy at all times. 
um, when you do some of those projects, besi besides the engineering, you have to have someone that will re really gonna draft that drawing on, in AutoCAD or get the surveying done or something like that. So there is a lot of, so it, with a company, you have already all that staff that will be able to do the service for us. So it may be just hiring one person may not be able to right. do all the tasks associated to what we give to them. Um, Thanks, that's very helpful. I mean, I'm actually really happy to hear this is a preferable solution for you. That's great news. Yeah, and um, you know, just to to you know uh, follow up with Mr. Jelski Eckner, I mean, this is a question we've asked year after year. So you know, I appreciate you uh, being very thoughtful about your question, and and I think these um, uh, explanations are really helpful for us moving forward. So thank, thank you. you. Um, okay, do we vote on that? We voted on that. We didn't. Okay, thank you. Okay, so <laughs> let's vote on that. Um, all in favor? <laughs> raise your hand, please. Opposed? Abstentions? All right, item four carries unanimously. Um, item five, authorize the mayor, Harry W. Willing, to execute an amendment to the March 29, 2021 agreement between the city of Norwalk and Tie and Bond, Inc. for project number DPW 2021 on-call engineering services. The amendment is to extend the agreement for a period of one year at a sum not to exceed $100,000 billable on an hourly basis with an option to extend for one additional term for one year. Um, account numbers noted. Who would like to move the item? Um, Ms. Johnson moves the item. Um, any questions on that? We know time bond is, you know, is pavement. Um, any questions? All right, seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? All right, that motion carries unanimously as well. Okay, <clears throat> item six, authorize the mayor, Harry W. Willing, to execute the First Amendment to the agreement between the city of Norwalk and Freeman Companies dated February 27th, 2019, to provide professional engineering services for the emergency reconstruction of the Rowayton Avenue Bridge in accordance with scope of services, extra work order number four, bridge preservation and rehabilitation of city owned bridges reconstruction of bridge number 102-009 Rowayton Avenue over Keeler's Brook dated December 1, 2021, copy included, for a sum not to exceed $150,000, account noted. Who would like to move that? Ms. Shanahan moves the item. Okay, well, we know this has you know, been an ongoing project and um, you know, hoping that we are nearing the end. Um, but uh, Anthony, if you would just like yes. to give us the specifics here. Absolutely, Madam Chairman. So this is a continuation of, of work that's already being performed uh, for the replacement of the Rowan Avenue Bridge over Killers Brook. Uh, Friedman Companies was the com company that originally came out and assessed the emergency conditions where the pavement failed and the concern arose following, I think it was uh, mid-July mid of, of um, uh, early in the year of 2021, uh, when this first first occurred, uh, the failure of the bridge. The, the This is just a continuation of works. This is why this is the, the first amendment or the first contract change. Uh, this is to provide design services and basically carry the Rowan Avenue bridge replacement project uh, to construction. So this is this is everything that we need for the, for the contractor to, to build and construct the project. And this is just professional services uh, related to the engineering and the design uh, to prepare a, a set of plans that's buildable and constructible uh, for the contractor, which is FGB. Um, Madam Chairman, I know that this item is also in the discussion item, but just to bring everything up to speed, the, um, the Royal Avenue Bridge did receive local permitting from the Conservation Commission, City of Norwalk. We also did receive our Connecticut deep approval. And I believe, uh, Vanessa and Paul could correct me if I'm wrong, we're still awaiting Army Corps permitting. We're very, very close. So that's the federal portion. Uh, we were more concerned about the state portion, but we did receive that approval. And I believe we placed the order uh, for the precast concrete box culvert, which is replacing, going to replace the existing stone arch masonry uh, and also half metal pipe, because it's two different materials that that culvert that goes underneath um, uh, Rowan Avenue Bridge. Um, we did release that um, to Concrete United for fabrication, I believe, two weeks ago. And that was pending our receipt of the permit approval from Connecticut Deep. So we didn't want to go ahead and release the, um, the box culvert uh, to, to 
concrete, uh, United Concrete for fabrication. If the state was going to say, oh, wait, wait a second, you got to change the size, the, the size, this is no good. We, we, we got to go back and change a couple of things. We didn't want to get to that point. So we, we had to hedge our bets and wait until the state approved. Um, although the federal approval has not come yet, we're less concerned about receiving Army Corps approval. And I believe that Vanessa and Paul had conversations with the Army Corps and they've already assessed which, which general permit this falls under and that this is more of a maintenance activity. So it's, it's tracking towards a, 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 an approval very soon. We just don't have the federal permit yet, which is why you haven't seen uh, any work go on uh, within that area. But you will see construction start uh, hopefully in the month of March. And we're hopeful that based on the six to eight week lead time uh, for the concrete box covert, that the project could be constructed in, in May of, of this year. Now, obviously if there's weather and other delays that might push it a little bit later, but everything really, the critical path item is the delivery of the culvert. Uh, but again, you will see the contractor FGB do some site work and site preparation in advance of placing that culvert. And some of that work includes uh, relocating um, utilities and or uh, utility poles. So there is work in advance, uh, stripping the pavement, there's things at mobilization to get the equipment on board, some of the materials. So there are things there that the contractor is gonna to do to set up and, and prep prior to delivery of the culverts. And, and, and then, then when the culverts come, there'll be a crane involved because they have to pick and set each, each section um, when they install uh, the culvert along the brook. But we are making very great progress and I have to commend Vanessa and Paul and the team to, for really sticking, sticking with this. I know this all happened last July, but we, we we worked feverishly and, and really the, the holdup was really more the regulatory and permitting. We, we couldn't place any order. I believe the box cover was about $250,000. Um, we, we, we couldn't place that order, uh, not knowing from the state at a minimum and having local approval. Um, in good conscience, we couldn't place that order until we received both those orders. Well, we made a little trick. We actually, we placed the order, but the process is they have to submit what we call shop drawings. So yes. they have to yes. send us drawings to us and that take a good six weeks. So they produce that. So we place the order and then we have to approve. So it goes into really manufacturing the, the culvert. And that's the part that we hold. We hold for one week or two until we got the confirmation. Right. As soon as we got a confirmation, we release the shop drawings. So we gain a lot of time. We didn't place the order now. Remember that you guys approved that back in, I believe, December. <laughs> and I think that that's when we placed the order. So we already had a, the order in line and then they work on the shop drawings. We received the shop drawings. We hold a little bit. They were calling us, um, are you approving? Are you approving? And then we are just waiting for Connecticut GEP uh, right. green light. As soon as we got right. that, we release and we, we, so we didn't lose our space. Right, we were on the line. list. We were, we, were, we were on the list, correct. Yep. Yeah, and actually we already started some utility work. So we already start, we installed new, the new poles on the new locations as of last week. So, so Anthony, this, this is- Appreciate your little quick. trick, by the way. <laughs> we appreciate your little trick, Vanessa. Yeah, I mean, this is great. Uh, I, I may have asked you this, how long do you think the actual uh, project will take? I mean, once you get the culvert- Eight in. weeks to 12, eight, no eight, more than eight, that. Eight to 12, yep. Okay, thank you. So it's just a question, we do not have a date yet about the, for the delivery, we should be getting a date soon, but to be honest, we, we don't wanna push because we don't have the other permit. As soon as we get the other permit, we're gonna go out after the culvert to, to really set up the delivery date. So we're like, we're playing chess here, you know, each day we move a certain piece to, to get to the other side of the board. We're almost there. Uh, we, we appreciate it. And you expect the Army Corps uh, permit within a week or so? so? Yeah, we should be getting soon because there was another item that was required from the SHPO that is because it was a historic bridge. So they needed that approval first. And we got already that approval last week and send it to them. So there should not be anything else pretty much holding them. Um, so again, tomorrow, Paul gives them another call he calls them every three, four days, <laughs> and then we should be getting very, very soon. Thank you, Paul, for your persistence. So I hope that in the next meeting, we're going to have a date for delivery of the COVID. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Very good. Keeping it moving. Um, all in favor, please raise your hand. 
Opposed? Abstentions? All right, item six carries unanimously. Okay, so we'll move on to information and discussion. Item A, we already talked about row eight and Avenue Bridge. I, 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 I don't think you have anything else to no. put on there, no? Okay, all right, so moving on to winter, the winter operations report. Yes, so Madam Chairwoman and, and committee, uh, we're, we're coming to close although uh, the winter season, although the um, March is always a tricky month. And that we've been, we, we've all know from our own personal experiences that you can still have pretty uh, decent snowstorms uh, during this month. So I don't want to rule it out. Uh, the temperatures are warming up, but again, I, I, I we, we tend to be a little more conservative and we anticipate at least a few small events, maybe one bigger event uh, this month. But again, uh, to date, we've had uh, 12 events and an event is basically anytime we have to call staff in and we have to salt and, and, and cloud the city. So we've had 12 storm events and over the course of the, of the 12 events, we've accumulated uh, about 29 inches of snow and approximately one to two inches of sleet, ice, frozen rain mixture. And, and, and again, that's the last few storms too, when it changes over, sometimes it didn't, but when you start off with snow and then you go to, to sleet and then freezing rain, uh, that usually comes down maybe a 10th of an inch in the storm. I mean, it's really, really thin, but obviously it's very dangerous and treacherous and, and you're trying to salt the, the, the snow and also salt the against the, the, the frozen rain, which you know in the sleet just creates a slick surface. So it definitely complicates uh, snow removal winter operations when you have that kind of Frankenstorm mixture, we call it, when you have every, every bit of precipitation. Um, you hope for rain because the rain typically washes it away and then it's warmer and all the salt you place kind of goes down the drain at that point, but you can't not salt because obviously that could lead to treacherous road conditions. So the um, we had total events, 29 inches of snow, uh, one to two inches of ice slash sleet. We've used approximately 2,400 tons of salt. And for reference, um, a couple of, couple of stats before we move off from this topic. Our salt shed holds up to 7,000 tons, but that's if you fill it to the top. We obviously have to get our equipment in there, uh, uh, loaders to take it out, scoop it out, dump it into the dump trucks. So we don't typically fill our salt shed the entire um, volume. So we usually keep it at about 5,000 tons. So we, we used about half of the salt that we have in our shed. And I know Chris is very much on top of it and always ordering more salt before the snowstorms even finish or before it even comes here, he's already ordering another thousand tons of salt. So we have plenty of salt. Uh, we actually are under our salt budget this year. And I would say our overtime budget uh, for snow removal is on par. Um, you know, with the last storm, we don't have the totals yet, but we're, we're just about there. So fiscally and, and, and also based on the season, our overtime budget and the funds expended do match up and align with what we anticipated. Uh, but we are happy to report that we are under the snow, um, excuse me, the salt material budget, which is in the end of the day, if the overtime comes in at budget or slightly higher, the salt will be significantly lower. So at the end of the day, the, the operations budget for snow would still be in the black. Um, and the CFO is aware of that. We, uh, and just to give you some rough stats too, we do maintain 625 lane miles of roadway a city roadway in, within Norwalk. And what a lane mile is, it, it's, it's basically the, 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 the length of, of each lane, right? So we, each, each road, some roads have three lanes, some roads have two lanes, right? One in each direction. So whatever your travel lane is, that, that's the, basically the length along a mile, right? So we have 625 of those, but we have 255 center line miles. So if you drew an imaginary line down the middle of all the roads, regardless of how many lanes you had or how wide they were, you would arrive at the 255 mile number. But for snow plowing purposes, the 625 lane miles is, is, is more pertinent and, and more important because you have to salt each lane per mile. So that if, if you rough crunch the numbers, what we really encountered over the last 12 events is we used about 200 tons per storm. And since I've started here, Chris and I always bounce the numbers off each other and then he reports and we update these numbers every year. We do use between little as 150 to 200 tons of storm up to maybe 900 if it's if if it's continuous you know 12 inches plus 18 inches 24 inches or, or you have a 10 inch storm 12 inch storm and then you have a combination of snow and sleet so we can use anywhere from 200 to 900 tons of storm but we typically hover in that two to two to 300 tons per storm and that average worked out for the 200 tons per storm that we have this year so far so the numbers work and again just to give you a little bit more context each dump truck holds about three to five cubic yards of salt. And let's, let's assume that each dump truck is filled with five cubic yards. 
uh, a one cubic yard of salt is about the equivalent of a, equivalent of a ton of salt. So ton is weight, cubic yard is volume, but to make it easy and, and, and the math kind of works out, if we have five cubic yards of salt in a dump truck, you have five tons. So that, that basically kind of gives you, when, when you see the DPW trucks driving around and, 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 the, and the, the back of the cab is loaded, it, it typically has three to five tons in it or three to five yards. Um, and, and the interesting part is if you break down the math even further, we, we, we've used about five to five and a half tons per truck per storm which basically translates to one load. And I've, I've been there for every snowstorm when, when we, whenever we plow, I'm there. And, and I, I watch when the trucks are filling and sometimes they're only filling up once if that. So all the math works out if they're, if they're salting with a load of, of, that has five tons of salt in it, they typically don't have to refresh unless again, you have one of those salt, um, sleet, freezing rain, Frankenstorms where you, you are gonna salt a little, bit, a little bit more per lane mile. And again, these are just all averages, but the numbers ground truth to what we hold, to what we take out, to what's left in the shed. General rules of thumb, what we use for the city. Um, and, and the other interesting fact, and I'm looking through my notes because I didn't want to forget about the, about the salting. The, um, in addition to the 625 lane miles, we also do maintain 19 facilities, uh, 19 school facilities, excuse me, plus city hall. So in addition to the 625 lane miles, there are also 20 facilities that we that we have, we have to clear, salt, treat, plow, et cetera, feed storms. So it is a lot of work, you know, whether it's, it's four inches, eight inches, it's, it's, it's really all the same level of effort. It just translates the time a little bit to the right for every, every two inches you get. But plowing six inches or plowing 12 inches, Chris will tell you, the foreman will tell you, anybody who's in the operations center, it just adds a few more hours to each of the operations, but it doesn't really change anything. It, it, it's, still, it's still the same work. So kudos to the operations department. We had kind of a funny, funny winter with, with, with the, um, we had a lot more freezing rain and a lot more of that slicked surface. And, and we've been very conservative. And if we do think that the road is going to be um, wet or have moisture or receive moisture from, from a storm, we, we do have staff on call. But in a couple instances or in several instances, we actually had a skeleton crew stay back, maybe a supervisor in two or three trucks uh, just to spot salt the trouble areas like Hospital Hill. Um, the shady or colder areas north of the uh, Merritt Parkway, the Silver Mine Cranberry area, uh, the northern part of the city tends to have microclimates and the pavement temperatures vary anywhere from, from two to five degrees in the north end of the city versus the south end. So it could be melting in South Norwalk, but you could have a layer of ice in, north, in um, northern Norwalk. And that line is typically um, Route 15 or the Merritt Parkway. So there's, there's a lot of moving parts that go on and there's a lot of things that could go wrong, but I have my hats off to the operations folks. Uh, they make it look very easy. Uh, Chris does a fantastic job managing uh, the effort. The, the foreman, Dylene Bird, is there the whole time too as a dispatcher. So it all comes together. We have a little fun doing it. I know several council members uh, came for a ride. Uh, some stopped down, so we appreciate that. And you know, it's just a little bit of a glimpse of the operation. But after a long night, once that sun starts coming up, and and, and drivers haven't eaten and they haven't slept as 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 a uh, as well as they would in their own bed. You know, things get a little bit harder, especially when you know you have another 12 hours of cleanup. So thank you for your recognition. You've, you've all been very fantastic with, with thanking the staff. And believe me, that that goes a long way because they, they remember that. And, and the fact that you show interest in what they do is something that's intrinsic and, and a, a bump in their salary maybe wouldn't even be as much, wouldn't be as worth it to them versus the actual public appreciation and, and the individual time that you take. To, to come down or talk to them or ask them what they're doing or, or show interest. So it means a lot. Um, it's definitely well received by the department and, and we really do appreciate that from all of you. We appreciate their work. Yeah. Thank great, you. Great job. Always, always. Thank you. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, Ms. Johnson, you have a question? Yeah, comment. I just want to very quickly say I live on the edge of, you know, Route 15 microclimate up here, and boy, during this ice storm, both of them, you you all were fantastic, and I just want to, again, thank you. Thank you. Um, got really slick up here, and you really made sure people were safe to go to work and school, um, and every time I see a plow, I wave, so they're gonna be like, who's that <laughs> crazy person waving? That's me, but yeah, so I appreciate them all, and thank you for everything y'all do. Uh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Absolutely. I missed this last storm, uh, being in Florida. Uh, and <laughs> I was happy to be in Florida, <laughs> but yep. I knew, you know, I know what a great job that you, uh, that you did. Um, Ms. Najewski-Eichner. 
And just to add one more, I so I live on a street that there's actually apparently a YouTube video of how miserable it is to plow um, that was put up several years ago. And I just want to applaud all of you. It has been beautiful this year. Everything has been plowed to a T. Um, whatever misery it causes for your drivers, they have done a spectacular job. So we really are very, very grateful. Um, it has just been a, it's been a difficult winter with all the icing down the hill and it's just yeah. been like flawless. So really very grateful. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Um, all right, so let's move on to item B, uh, tree operations report and programming. Yes, so Madam Chairman, we have an, uh, obviously due to the, due to the uh, weather, we haven't uh, planted any, any, any new trees, but uh, we surely are uh, coordinating future plans for that, um, some of which we will be sharing in upcoming meetings. Uh, but I want to focus this report more on the status of the other source permit and, and, and their, their pending tree maintenance work, which will occur um, in, in the springtime and once the weather uh, changes for the better. So there is a, there is a site visit scheduled for this Friday morning at 8.30 uh, in row eight and to, for Eversource representatives, uh, specifically Sandberg, uh, to walk the arborist, uh, Eversource arborist, to walk the site uh, with the tree warden, uh, Chris Torrey, and deputy tree warden, and uh, senior engineer, um, Paul Sotnik, just to go over the scope of work. Um, figure out exactly what they're doing as far as their, their maintenance operations in each, each specific area that they're gonna be working. Meaning, are they pruning the trees? Uh, is, it, is it just a barely a light trim? Is it, is it a removal, um, et cetera? So we don't have a final list yet of the actual uh, removals, but I could tell you that once we do have a finalized list, we could, we could definitely share that um, at the upcoming public works committee meeting, we, we should have that list. Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, next month, um, obviously before anything, before any work happens. So the thing I just wanted to, to convey to the committee, and I know Paul could, could, could further elaborate, is that even though our tree ordinance does require, our local tree ordinance requires a one for one replacement of, of removed trees, um, you oftentimes can't plant the same spot because you have the trunk system, um, you have roots there, and, and, and a lot of times the, the, the trunk is, and, and the in the stump is left in place. So you could plant, you know, new trees in similar areas as long as there's no utilities or other conflicts, right? But the uh, the thing is, we are working with Eversource very diligently and they understand the message that uh, we don't want to remove trees unless we absolutely have to, unless the asset is dead or it could pose a serious health condition. Or let's just say there's a scenario where they can, Eversource can say, okay, well, we'll just prune it. We'll over prune the tree but then the city stuck with it in two to three years and then it becomes our expense to remove. But, but even more so, it becomes our liability. And those, those trees may not be many, but we don't wanna have a scenario where, um, and Eversource has been open with this, and then Paul and Jose Ortiz, um, the, another deputy tree warden that works under Chris, and Chris and myself, we are in communication with Eversource. And, and if nothing else, we've conveyed to them that the tree removals have to be limited. They, they understand the sensitivity to it, um, both publicly and also from the sustainability standpoint. Um, and they have put a pause on the use of herbicides and pesticides. So they're, they're, they're not moving forward with any of that, uh, that chemical that was discussed at prior public works committee meetings. That's all tabled um, indefinitely, but they, do, they will be walking the site and they will be determining, I know Councilwoman Shanahan and, and, and President uh, Livingston will be walking with them and, and you'll, you'll get a flavor and a taste for what they look for in the trees and, and, and every source, they document the, the conditions of the trees. So we're there as a third party. And basically if there's a pruning, we agree or we disagree, or if there's a proposed removal, we, we either concur or disagree. So there, there's experts there that know if the tree should be removed or not. It's not ever source unilaterally you know, just, just tagging a tree. They cannot tag a tree unless the tree warden and the deputy tree wardens all are in agreement that this tree is dangerous, it's dead, it's not healthy, and yes, there's an absolute need for removals. So there, that will not, they will not be tagged unless there is an absolute need for it. But like I said, we're still developing that list and we're still working with them to find a healthy balance where whatever trees are removed, that there is a, a sufficient or an adequate amount of, of replantings. Now, if they remove 25 trees for the whole project, you know, will we get 25 trees back? We're, we're working our hardest to get as close as we can to the one-to-one -one replacement 
But at this point in time, and to be completely transparent, we can't guarantee that that one for one would happen. And, and one is cost, but two, they can utilize their, their pure abilities, right? Which is a state mandate. So this, this kind of a rocks, paper, scissors game, the, the pure mandate is the rock and, 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 and uh, the, the, the global ordinance is the scissors. Although it's very effective, they can pull uh, their point of view and say, look, we can't put, we can't replant 25 trees. Let, let's, you know, let's be reasonable and, 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 and strategic where we replant, but we may not be able to give you 25 trees. Let's find, let's, let's strike a balance. So I have made that, I have conveyed that to the administration and also to some of the council members too, so that we're all looking at it from the same vantage point that we are working to get as close as we can to that one-to-one -one ratio. And Paul, I know you've had discussions with Mr. Berg and Kathy Lezon and they, they, they get it, they understand, but what will end up happening versus what's required in the ordinance versus what Pura allows them to do is still a little bit in, um, in flux and we're working to get the best deliverable and, and the, best, the best we can for the city. So Paul, if you wanna add a little bit to that, your conversations with Sandberg and, and where they're, what position they have right now. And just to give everybody an idea too, uh, as Chris Torrey has mentioned previously uh, in other years where we have walked down streets down say uh, in Dock Road area, they had originally wanted to take down 11 trees. We were able to negotiate and get that down to one tree. And that's what we try to do on each one of them. When Jose Ortiz reviews it, nothing gets, he has to post it. They can't remove anything until it's agreed to with us. And wherever we can try and get them down, we do try and talk them down to taking down fewer and fewer trees as long as it's safe and in the best interest of the city. Um, yeah, I think, I, just, I think we have some questions here. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Shanahan. No, I just was going to thank um, both Mr. Carr and Mr. Sotnik for fighting for our trees, which um, I loved hearing Mr. Carr say, our assets, because that's how I view them. And um, I think that's fantastic. And I really appreciate the city working so hard to keep our canopy as full as it can. And also for convincing Eversource not to use uh, that chemical, which we came to find out was completely toxic to fish, which is horrific for a city on the water like ours. So I really appreciate how hard you guys are working and um, I'll try not to be difficult on Friday, I promise. <laughs> no, but, but, but when you're there on Friday, you know, ask them these questions too. And, and, you know, he's a licensed arborist. You have Jose Ortiz, who's a deputy tree warden, but he's, like I said, he's one of the DPW operations foremen who handles tree operations. Uh, you know, look, find trees that they're, that they're proposing uh, to remove. And I'm sure if you specifically ask Mr. Berg to point those out to you, you could have a conversation and say, okay, you could look at a few of them. And if they're proposing at that point, you know, conceptually, without any approvals, that this has to be removed, I, I would, I may be at that meeting, if, if I could attend, I might have a conflict, but I, I would encourage the question and dialogue to say, well, well, why? What, what about this tree, you know, and then and then you look at a couple of them, hopefully there's not many, but if there are a number of them, at least it gives you some insight into their perspective. And, and, and whether we agree, obviously, we, we don't want to see any tree removed. But at least it'll it'll give you a little bit of a, of a of a sense of what goes into their assessment, and then how DPW responds back to their assessment, and 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 it's almost like a live view of of of, of the iterative process that's going to go on beyond that site walk on Friday. There's going to be an exchange, and like Paul said, eleven trees down to one. I think is pretty impressive. You know, you, you don't want to get in a situation where ever source says, "All right, city, well, you know what? We'll leave them all, but we'll over butcher them. We'll over prune them. Now they're not symmetrical. Now they look even worse than they did before." And then you get that, you know, the tropical storm, and, and then there's a wind wind event, and you know where that can go. So, and then then, let alone cost, it's just more public safety and welfare. I mean, money can be replaced. You know, lives sometimes you know can't, depending on the extent of the damage, right? Even property can be replaced. But so we're just looking so that that limb doesn't fall in that car and cracks through the windshield and kills somebody else that hurts them. So that's the, you know, we don't want to be stuck with that product. So again, it's a very very fine balance. Um, we understand everybody's position on the committee and in the city, and and again, we will fight for as much as we can to not be removed and also fight to get as much as we can be planted. But will it be a one for one? At this point, we can't answer that, but, but we're working to get as close to one for one relief. Also, if I can just add, I might have mentioned this at the last um, at our last meeting, but uh, when Mr. Keegan and I did the tree walk uh, with Eversource and Paul was there and uh, Jose Ortiz and Chris Torrey, um, um, it was very quick. We, we saw two trees. It was, you know, fairly short area, actually, a uh, small area where two trees had to be taken down. And, you know, it, there was no doubt 
I mean, you know, Paul, you know, you were like tapping on the tree and, and you, know, you were able to, you know, stick your ruler, your, um, you know, your, whatever your measure. Tape measure, yeah. Your, that's, that's the name of it. Um, yeah, sorry. I'm, sorry. Um, yeah, like all the way through the tree, there was no doubt this tree was dead. The tree was threatening the power lines. It was also threatening the house, you know, so that tree has to come down. Um, and the other tree was an ash tree you know, one of the last few living uh, in the state, you know, so the, the, the trees are clearly dead and clearly a threat. And, and, and again, I was impressed with, you know, Sam, when, uh, when Chris Torrey said to him, so, so Sam, we don't want you to be using any herbicides until we say it's okay. He said, okay. You know, so I, I think they're doing their very best to work with us. And that's and good, Madam Chairwoman, that, that, that Paul had the hammer. I know he takes it out the site, site walks. I've, I've been introduced to that as well. And, it, and, it, and it's helpful, though. It gives you perspective when you hear it's hollow at the base of the trunk. And it, and it really, it gives you some comfort, at least. And, and uh, look, Eversource doesn't want to take down the trees either. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a lot of work for them. I mean, you know, they got to pay their contractor. And it, it, just, it just prolongs the operation as well. So, again, we don't want to see trees taken down for our reasons. But they don't want to take them down either because it really isn't easier just to take the tree down. It's actually a lot more work. And, and, and it really prolongs their, their, their operation and, and people can get hurt doing it. So, so if you could leave the tree there and just prune, that's, that's ideal. I mean, Paul, Paul could add to that. I mean, you know, it's. Yeah, they, they'd rather not have to do the work if they could get, a, get away with it. And as Chair, Chairperson uh, Smith said, it's pretty interesting when you think a tree is solid and you can stick a tape measure a foot under a two foot diameter tree where it's all rotted. It, it, you, you don't realize what's really holding the tree up, or in this case, not holding it up. You know, and, I, and I'd just like to add to, uh, to uh, Anthony, uh, that I appreciate your efforts to work with Eversource. And, you know, I, I, I understand, you know, one-to-one -one, uh, replanting is not gonna happen, but, you know, let's get as close as we can um, and be very mindful about uh, what we are able to replant and have them replant. Uh, Understood. Ms. Johnson, I, I Thought you might have a question there. Oh, I do. Thank you. I, just, to, just to be clear, so that that piece about Pura is interesting. Thank you very much, Chief Carr. I I know that we talked about this before. For um, the trees that are on city property, and we have our expert uh, ordinance chair Shanahan here. So I would want. I don't want to get this wrong, but with our tree fund, is this an applicable? Um, is this applicable? Like, would Eversource then be an entity that would donate to our tree fund in lieu of not having a one-to-one, -one, depending where the tree is, of course? Yeah, that that that's certainly a possibility. Yeah, that, that's we we could certainly ask them. It's not outside of our fiscal purview, or uh, um, mechanically and procedurally. Yes, we could accept the money from Eversource, and that's what the tree fund is exactly meant to do. Um, and it might just be easier for Eversource instead of them going through Almstead of their contract. Yeah, sure. We could we could eventually negotiate uh, what we find find to be an adequate planting, and again, we'll we'll walk everybody through the process on that. I mean, we'll give you updates as, as we receive them. But the uh, yeah, the, the short answer to the question is that would definitely be a, a good use for it, um, and it might actually benefit them from not having to worry about the installation and the labor and the materials, and, and it's one less thing for them to manage. So, if they're amenable to it, we certainly uh, we have a meeting with them. Uh, Tomorrow, right, Paul? Yes. We will certainly raise that to them and, and might just be easier for them to write a check. Oh, that's great. I'm going to defer to uh, Council Member Shanahan on all tree things tree, but I am so grateful you mentioning that tomorrow. Appreciate it so much. Thank you. I love the You're idea. Very, yeah, very welcome. It's easier. And then, you know, when we're ready to deploy the funds, we do at the right, right place. Right. And we pick the locations. Correct. Yeah. Yep. I love it. Thank you, Dominique. Excellent. Great question. Teamwork. And great answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have, Madam Chairman, for the uh, for the tree operations report. All right. Any other questions there? Okay. Um, moving on to the monthly solid waste report for January. Yes. Yes. So compared to January of 2021. Uh, volumes and, and, and weights. So when you say a volume, that's a, that's a cubic yard, a weight is a ton. Um, they continue to decline uh, from, from, again, the same point last year, which if we all recall, March 2020, we really went, you know, we, we kicked COVID-19 pandemic off. I'd say by January 2021, we were, we, that's, that was the, the midpoint or the hump, and we were very much in the throes. 
uh, of COVID-19. So that is a good benchmark uh, to see that 2021 was a year later into the pandemic, but comparatively now looking back from where we are now, the numbers are all negative, meaning that their percent decreases. The amount of recycling is down, unfortunately, but the amount of garbage is down too. And then the amount of, when I say garbage, that's municipal solid waste, that's MSW, that's everything that's not recycling. Uh, all the numbers are trending down, which isn't a bad thing either, because that is also less that we have to pay for the garbage to go out, which right now we pay $95 a ton. So it, it's we're definitely getting back. We were operating at, at a high norm. I'd say probably summer, from January, 2021 through the summer, we just started seeing the numbers come down probably in, in, in the yeah late summer, early fall of last year. I mean, they were trending down a little bit, but they were still positives. Now we're seeing a lot more negatives and the negatives are actually increasing. So we're, we're definitely returning to pre-pandemic levels, but we're still operating a little bit higher than, than, than usual than before the pandemic even started. So, but we are trending back to, to a normalcy as far as the waste management business is concerned. And we'll continue to watch that. But like I said, it, it, the recycling revenue is down, which is a little bit um, disheartening because um, you would think with more people home, they'd want to recycle more, and they, but they're not, unfortunately, but the gar- amount of garbage is down likely because of people returning to work and returning to the office and, and maybe getting new jobs or getting jobs that they didn't have before. So we will continue to monitor that, but we are returning to normalcy. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Very good. Um, and on to the food scrap drop-off report. Yes, so to date, we've uh, we've collected approximately 94.73, 95 tons of food scraps. Um, again, this is a pilot program, but it's, it's, it's in its second fiscal year. And I believe the last last year, the way we, uh, the first fiscal year, which ended June 30th of 2021, uh, we saw a split, the, the, the ratio between the Rowayton Community Center and the transfer station was approximately 65% to 35% respectively. So about two thirds of the, of the, of the food scraps are being um, collected from Rowayton, the other third uh, from the transfer station. So we're still seeing that same number pretty close uh, to date for this fiscal year. Again, from July 1, 2021 to present day, uh, we do have the 70% of our food scrap waste stream, waste stream um, is collected from Rowayton Community Center, and then the other 30% is collected from the transfer station. And again, just as a reminder, uh, if the operating budget is approved as currently proposed, we did request additional funding up where, upwards in the amount of $12,000 um, to supplement and subsidize a third pickup location, which uh, unless something changes would likely be the Cranberry Park, uh, both for permitting reasons and also because for, for the program, it needs to be a, a staff facility or has to be, have the ability to, for have, to have staff oversee, collect and secure the area. So, it will be Cranberry Park unless something changes. Um, and we're, we're excited because that that third location will bridge the gap between the other two locations in the city. So we expect that to be very successful. And I think the program is 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 exceeding certainly my expectations. Um, although we knew it would be successful, we're, we're really proud of how quickly, um, you know, that this, this really came together. And 100 tons is, is 200,000 pounds, right? So that's almost a quarter million uh, pounds of of uh, food scraps that would normally go to the municipal solid waste stream that's now being used as compost and more for, and more for sustainable um, uses. So to me, that's a win. I think you've answered this question before, uh, but assuming you know the operating budget goes through and you have the funds, uh, approximately when might we see the um, the station at Cranberry Park? I would say if the Hopefully, when the funds get approved, uh, July first, uh, we we would speak to the vendor about uh, which is curbside curbside compost. Uh, we would speak to the vendor. I mean, really, at that point, what we would do is we would we would have the vendor deliver the the amount of toters. We would we would probably start off with only a few, just to see how much that location actually um, is used. Although we do anticipate um, something similar to Rowing and more than the transfer station. Uh, from that point. We would, we would utilize social media to get the word out, um, certainly at the meetings. I would say probably by the, at, when you're in July, you're about what, the early summer, midsummer. I would say probably before the, by the midsummer, before the end of the summer, 
that program would be stood up and that their location would be active. Again, there's not a lot of effort to do it in the sense that we have the we have the vendor go, they drop off the uh, the toters, what, what, 35 gallon uh, toters, maybe maybe more. Um, we, we do our marketing, we do the advertising, we do the public outreach and the education, and then the program is is, is alive and that their location is active as soon as we, basically as soon as we deliver the toters. Mr. Livingston? Yeah. Are there any economies of scale, do you think, when getting price breaks if we open a new location? There could there could be. I, I do recall I do recall the vendor mentioning that the more, and this was in our initial discussions, I don't know if it was memorialized, but basically the, the, the more locations we have, right, that there's a little bit of a, of a value for them, right? Because they could, they're in the same area, they're in the same city, same day. Uh, we can certainly uh, see if they'd be willing to entertain a, a reduction in the in, in the cost per pickup because that's how that's how it that's how the uh, the program is managed. It's it's the amount of the amount of um, times they have to come yeah. and pick up the, the bin, right? So I think it's I think it's five dollars a toter, and and it's x amount of x amount of days. Um, excuse me, x amount of weeks per month that we pick up. I think we have eight toters at the Rowayton Community Center and eight toters at um, the transfer station. And I believe that picked up once a week. And then on average, they picked up once a week, but then in the summertime, we, we increased the collection because of the smell and because of the heat and the temperature. So, but we, we work that out so that we know in, in the winter time and in the fall, we, 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 we go to a, a reduced collection. And then in the summertime, we go to an increased collection. Yeah, it'd be great if you can get some sort of break or even if we no, just- I, I, I agree. Okay. We, we certainly will inquire. Ms. Shanahan has a question. Yeah, I just, Anthony, you probably haven't been to the Rowan in a little while. We went for the bigger toters. We have five big toters now. That's right. Yes. That's right. You had, eight, you had eight of the small ones, right? Now you have exactly. Five. And it got too crowded there. So right. then we went for the five bigger ones, which he doesn't like to do because they're so heavy, but yeah. he yeah. accommodated us. The question I was going to have is, um, how are we doing with, um, and you may not know this, it might be Jessica uh, Palladino that knows this, how many leftover little kits do we have? I think that I know that we sold around a hundred, but I think we still have enough that it could be also part of your social media campaign to sell those kits, which are $25 a shot. You have like the um, one that you have down in the basement and then you've got the one for the counter and then you come right. with the bags. Right. We had 250, I believe we purchased, we sold a hundred. So I know, I know we have about at least a hundred left. Uh, I can get that number and I'll circulate the answer, but I know we have between the hundred and 150 left. Um, and right, that kit is the uh, the BPI certified uh, biodegradable plastic bags, yeah. uh, the two gallon kind of countertop um, bucket, and then the and then I believe it's a, a five gallon kind of like the size of, of of an office recycling um, container uh, that you'd have in your office or your home office or where wherever it is that you that you work. But it's a little bit more of a of an office grade. So there's this there's the five gallon a six gallon uh, bucket, then there's a two gallon bucket. And then there's the bags, correct. Um, I believe we have 100 to 150 left. And I will confirm that number. Yeah, because I'd be happy to like maybe do one afternoon with anybody who happens to be a common council member from that district to sit and sell them because uh, people found those really helpful. And so, you know, maybe one or two days. And it's a good way to um, share the information and share the sheets about what's good to go, uh, go in, not go in, things like that. So when you're ready, I'm happy to be helpful with any and maybe we can grab some other council people. Absolutely. Not Sounds me. good. Um, Ms. Um, one other kind of uh, sort of out of your, probably out of your jurisdiction question, but um, Tom talking about economies of scale made me wonder, um, do you have any sense or information of, you know, our grocery stores, Costco, our restaurants, is there anyone doing sort of industrial composting for our businesses? And is there any sort of connection or tie-in that we could build on, you know, coordinate, uh, you know, encourage people to start using that would also help, you know, potentially um, allow us to do economies of scale with our personal collection? I just, you know, I'm curious whether this has come across your radar, if you have any information on, I know it's outside your, your yeah, no, purview. We, we haven't, um, we haven't dealt much with the private entities and I don't think you know, to my understanding, and I could follow with Ms. Palladino and, and Mr. Tori, we don't have any visibility on if those private entities are are, are participating in their own food composting. 
uh, food scrap composting and say, excuse me, uh, mm -hmm. we don't have, we don't have visibility, visibility of records. We can continue uh, to promote public outreach, but there's, there's nothing in our ordinance or any, any, sure, any it's not in your, yeah, it's not in any, your jurisdiction, but I was right. curious. If you it, across, it's right. outside. And, and I don't know if we would be able to, to, even if we did have a, I don't know the mechanics of logistics of a private public partnership either, mm -hmm. how that would work with, with using the city funding. So yeah, we have right now, I can tell you, we don't have any um, active commercial entities participating and no one has approached us about it. Okay. Everybody who, who has come across has been um, a resident. Yeah. Go ahead, Ms. Shanahan. Nora, I, just, I can talk to you offline about that. I know a little bit about that because there is some state Connecticut laws that say that if there's an anaerobic um, right, but we don't have one near enough by yeah, to require enough. it. No, yes, yeah, so I've looked at that too. And that's why I was kind of curious if, if Anthony or, or anyone else in the department had information about people who were sort of voluntarily doing it, because obviously it's would be a nice starting point for us if we did. It'd so I was great. just curious. Let's, we're yeah. going to try to talk about that, the ad hoc sustainability. Try to oh, totally. No, I know. Absolutely. That's on the agenda. Because um, I feel like we should get one in Norwalk, right? Shouldn't we just get a, you know, a compost site in Norwalk and then it would, we would be, everyone would be required and it would make our toting much easier. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's like called an anaerobic digester. I think it's a special thing they want to. It is, yeah. That's exactly yeah. what it's called. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and they were supposed to build one in Bridgeport and they didn't. So, you know, why not come to us? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting and great concept, that idea. Um, okay, are there any other questions or thoughts or comments on that or anything else before we? Okay, uh, all right then, very good. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I think I saw Ms. Shanahan. All right, <laughs> very good, all in favor? All right, well done. Um, everyone have a good night. You too, good night. Good night. Take care everyone, stay safe. You too, bye-bye.